Thank Works? All right, before I go into that, I want to convince you that this talk is for you. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should seriously consider making Godot tutorials. The first is the selfless reason. Most of you in here are interested in Godot because it's free and open source. Not all, I'm sure there are other reasons. The usability, the node system, it's a, it's a cool engine, right? But it is simply good to do good. If you've been watching The Good Place, you know, it's, it's the categor categorical imperative from Immanuel Kant. It feels good to make the world a better place. But there's a selfish reason. The more people we have fluent in this engine, happy about this engine, wanting to make stuff in this engine, the more people donate to the Patreon. The more people committing their work to the engine, the more features we get, right? So with all of those things, you should be making tutorials. But there's another one. If you want to really understand a topic, if you want to really ferment and, and other adjectives, your knowledge of a topic, teach it. The process of breaking down what you know into smaller chunks and then reassembling it in a logical order, like with code, helps you develop your understanding further. So with those things, I'm going to teach you not, you know, here's how you make a one-off video, here's how you make a series. I'm going to give you some basic education theory and some best practices so that you can take your style and develop the best possible tutorial. The hardest thing, I like to pace my talk, the hardest thing when you're making any kind of instructional content is knowing where to pitch it. So I want to start with basic education theory and Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, because it's early, I haven't enough coffee, and I want to say Vygotsky a lot. This is Lev Vygotsky. He was a Soviet educational theorist in the 1910s, 1920s. He's not the only educational theorist. theorist. He's not the only person making teachy things. Um, Piaget is very big. I like Vygotsky's stuff a lot. And one of the ideas he came up with was this concept of the zone of proximal development. And here's how it works. Right now, on any subject, on Godot, on French, on drama, on dance, there is stuff that you, as a very happy student, here's a very happy student, can do without help. So if I put in front of you a current version of Godot 3.2, I say, can you make a sprite move left, right, up, down with the arrow keys? You could probably do that without help. Most people in this room, right? If I say, can you rewrite the physics engine? No. Not only can you not rewrite the physics engine, you can't do that today with help. See, what we're interested in is this sweet spot, the zone of proximal development. How much can your student do today with your help? Because there will come a point where your brain will simply melt. Anything, right? Most people in this room can probably say hello in French. But if I ask you to write a play in the style of Molière, that is a completely different thing. Some of you can, some of you could do it with help, some of you can't. Rule one of making any instructional content, there is no perfect instructional content, right? There are perfect instructional contents, but there is no one way of doing it. All right, so how does this apply to us? Let's talk about physics body 2D. If I say, make a scene, add a node, put a static body in it, easy. If I say, let's have a whole new physics engine that follows non-Euclidean mathematics, the second word you're going to give me is off. That's where your teaching goes. The other major thing you want to know is how complex should you be making this? And for this, I want to turn to Bloom's taxonomy. This is Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, this is actually the revised version from 2001 by Anderson. Um, and the idea is this. We're going to break down any topic into the level of complexity that you need to have mastered. So there are various tasks you can do that are simply easier than others. At the bottom is remembering. Remembering the word bonjour is easy, right? Understanding what it means is not that difficult. Good day, bonjour. Same in Japanese, kono nichi wa, konnichi wa, about this day. Applying it, when do you use it? Creating new French words. Usually these are split into higher order thinking skills and lower order thinking skills. And there is an actual split here. I don't like using these terms because they get abbreviated to hots and lots, and that drives me crazy, but you can, you know, if it makes you happy, do that. Let's talk about our example, going back to physics 2D nodes. Remembering, lowest order thinking skill. This is the basic stuff you need, right? If I ask you to name physics body 2D nodes, because anyone name a physics body 2D node? Rigid body, static body, kinematic body 2D, and physics body 2D, right? Fine. 
Once you have those, even if you forget the actual name, you know where to look. That's in your, that's, you're now fluent in that level of complexity. Understanding it. How is a rigid body 2D different from a kinematic body 2D? I know we've got to talk on exactly, the, you know, well, not this one, but further down tomorrow, and I'm looking forward to that. But this is the knowledge that a rigid body 2D moves because force is applied to it. A kinematic body moves because it has, it has its own force. It's moving itself, right? Essentially, that's where we're going. Fine. Applying. Okay, now you know how to use them. How do you set one up? At the lowest level, we're just talking about dragging the node into the scene, naming it, done. At the higher level, we're talking about things like collision masks, collision layers, signals, group calls, all that business. Uh, maybe we're going to apply some physics materials and change them in code. And then we get this split, analyzing. We've now moved from just basic memorization and rote learning into critical analysis, and that's what you're striving for. You want people to go from, I've memorized this, to I am fluent in it. I can play in this. And I want to give you an example on this. How does a rigid body 2D move? And here is something that came up in the course I'm currently working on, Gotta Get Away. If you don't know it, it's a very traditional game. It's a 3D online multiplayer cops and robbers driving procedure generated game to Electro Swing. Because we can do features creep at my company. Like we will just go all in. We're making this prototype game, and I, I've recreated it in, in the course so students can see the problem here. So I'm about to show you a video if it loads. On the left-hand side, we have the host. This is very, very, very early prototype. The game doesn't look like this in the end, right? This is just, we've got some movement, we want the movement to go over the net code, and we want to update the physics. Host, client, ball. Both cars are physics, um, no, they're vehicle body 2Ds. Vehicle body 2D is a specialized rigid body, right? So you're moving your car locally on your machine. If you're the client machine, every frame, you send your transform to the host. Every frame, the host decides where you and the ball is. The ball is a rigid body. And then to all clients, it sends this is what the current state of the game is. You have to do this in a competitive game because you, it, we can't have drift happening. We can't have you thinking the ball is here and me thinking the ball is here, right? And here is what happened. So don't worry about the spawn. Um, here's the host. Here's the client. Here's the ball. First, the host is going to drive at the ball. What do we expect to happen? We expect some shonky driving. That's me. I learned to drive in New Jersey. We hit the ball. The ball rolls. Fine. Now let's try that with the client. What do we expect to happen? The client will drive to the ball, the driver will hit the ball, the ball will roll, right? Fine, let's give it a shot. Here's the thing. To understand why that's happening, you have to understand how the physics body works in Godot because I am sending transform information. And rigid body moves through physics, and physics is a property of physics body. I have to be able to analyze this, right? The moment I figured this out, by the way, my mind just suddenly clicked and I had an epiphany and I understood Godot in a completely different way, which is why I've put it in the course. This is the kind of thing that if you haven't figured out not just how to use it, but how it's actually constructed, you don't master it, right? It's the difference between memorizing some phrases uh, J'ai réservé une chambre non de Yann, and be able to say, mais non, l'électricité ne marche pas. Ça, c'est ma chambre. Non, ça, ce n'est pas ma chambre. Right? Don't do the second one. They'll kick you out of the hotel. <laughs> this didn't happen. This is why we're, we're moving into the higher order thinking skills, and that is the wrong button. This is the right button. Okay. From there, once you've understood that, then you can start to say, when do I use this situation? You can do this with anything, by the way. It's not just physics body. This is an example. You could do this with variables and memory usage and input mapping and everything all the way up to, I don't know, virtual reality. Finally, you can start making new stuff based on this knowledge. All of these are helpful skills. Traditionally, in online tutorials, we focus here. GD Quest tends to focus on the intermediate. They make fantastic stuff. Kids can code a sort of middle road. There's a reason for that. Usually, when people make this gap, they don't need you anymore. They can self-teach, right? Not always. There is still people saying, how do I use this thing? 
right? I've still never played with GeoProbe. That looks great. I have yet to figure out how to successfully use navigation mesh in a procedure generated grid map. I know it's possible, I just haven't figured that out yet. When I do, it's going on a course. All right, from there, you've, you've tuned the kind of complexity you want, the kind of ideas you want. From there, you need to actually make sure your students will kick in. So we're going to start talking with, well, I say kick in, they're going to uh, invest. That's the term we use in education. I really hate jargon, so I, I make it up as I go, which is really helpful when you teach coding, by the way. My students make fun of me for using the word boop when I mean connect. Um, how do you make sure the learning works? How do you keep students engaged? And some of this is true in schools and online education. Some of this is something we've still not successfully learned in online education. It takes some work. You cannot just digitize a classroom. People will tune out. All right. There are certain predictors of student success. Research tells us these things correlate. We cannot say they're causally linked. Education is essentially a branch of psychology, so it's a soft science. It's very hard to make causal links like that. But we know that if a student is motivated to learn, they're much more likely to do well. And you probably know this from your own experience, right? I'm guessing there's at least one subject in school that you really worked at, and you didn't care about the subject, and you didn't want to learn it, and my god, it was hard, right? If you want to learn it, you'll learn it. If you don't, you have to push yourself. Belief that success is attainable. This is where we come in as online educators, right? And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. If a student does not believe they can physically succeed at something, they will phone it in. And this is an ongoing problem in all forms of education. Have you ever worked really hard at the subject you just started, taken the first test, and then realized, I'm not good at this? Because you got that first grade, and it told you, nope. Your friend worked half as hard, stayed up all night partying, depending on their age, and aced the test. And you told yourself, well, that's fine. I'm just not a math person, or I'm not good at languages. Nonsense. You're a human being. You can do all of this. Some of it will be easier at first. But if we teach people that success is not attainable, you're just not good at this. Oh, you're, you're not a logic person. You're a creative person. The amount of coders who tell me they're not creative. If you can write elegant code, you are creative. Access to resources. We are getting better at this. So typically in traditional education, we're talking about things like someone at home to help with homework a support network emotionally, a stable home life. Access to a computer at home is a predictor of success in school. Um, access to regular meals. You know, if we know a student doesn't have these, they will not do well at school, or they can, but they have to work three times harder. And the predictors tell us that they will not do as well. Online, this is stuff like, is stuff available in enough languages, in enough formats? Are we dealing with people who are hard of hearing successfully? Are we dealing with colorblind successfully? Can we put tutorials that don't require high-end machines? My current course requires a decent 3D graphics card. Right? That, it doesn't fulfill this criteria. But there's other stuff we can do there. And this one is where we fall down on. One of the most important things for doing well in education as a student is believing that the instructor has your back, that they will pick up if you've made a mistake and support you to get better. They'll give you useful feedback. And by useful feedback, I mean, I really like what you did there, but have you considered this, as opposed to, could you try doing that again, but good? Because I've had those teachers too. All right, so now, how does this apply to us? There's this weird thing that happens with online education, whether it's tutorials or university courses or whatever it is. The strengths of online education are the weaknesses of online education. It's like Sun Tzu wrote a syllabus. I'll give you some brief examples. We can reach thousands of students. Right now, just on Udemy alone, I have 3,600 students. There is no way I can personally interact with each of them and debug their code. And it drives them nuts. And of course it does. They want support. So we have to find another way of creating that support network, encouraging students, encouraging a community to grow. You can watch at any time. One of the great advantages to a tutorial is I've had a long day at work, I finished school, it's the weekend, I'm hungover, I've got 20 minutes, I don't know how to do this thing, I'll just look it up. However, unlike university, I've got to do this in three years, I'm in huge amounts of debt, oh my god, my parents are going to kill me, yada, 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 all my friends are doing this. There's very little investment here. If you've paid $9.99 for a 40-hour course and you do the first five hours, it's fine, you can do the rest some other time, right? 
It's very hard to keep students motivated. It's self-guided learning, which means it's really easy to learn bad habits. I learned a bunch of bad habits in my first course. It's the real reason I'm trying to remaster Discovering Godot. I put some bad habits in there, right? I put everything as a global variable. You're welcome. <laughs> it's not like that now. You can pick a subject on a whim with online learning. Want to learn about quantum mechanics? Fine, go to YouTube. Feel like learning Japanese? Duolingo. But you won't get certified for it. Right? When, they ask for you, when they ask you, OK, so you want to be a Japanese translator, what have you got? I've got Duolingo. Cool. Right? This is an area that we fall down in. We can offer certificates. Udemy offers certificates. I don't represent Udemy. I'm just talking about them because I've worked with them a lot. But that certificate is for the student to feel good that they've achieved something. You can't take that into a job interview and say, look, I've got a Udemy course. Cool. And low cost, little investment. All right. We know that online education works best when the student feels the instructor is personally invested. Live streaming rocks for this. Show hot code as you're developing it. Show it behind the scenes, all the rest of it. Take questions, make jokes, get to know their names. A tiny proportion of your students will get involved in that, but they will become representatives for the course. They will help the other students. They are emotionally invested in your course. This is not me trying to be emotionally manipulative. This is me giving students the tools to help other students. Back to Vygotsky. Give them a sense of community. This can be very hard to do, right? If you want to nurture a, a, an inclusive, supportive community, and you need both of those, because you're going to have people coming in who are very nervous about their code and coming in saying, I don't know why this if doesn't work. And someone says, because you haven't put a colon in, you muppet. You're never seeing that student again. Right? They haven't learned any. What they've learned is code is a mean, which is a valuable lesson, but not a good lesson. Students need to feel like they're making progress. At the end of every video, they should feel like they know something now they couldn't do before. Otherwise, it's one of those lectures that you sat, sat through at school where it's like, I know this. Why? Remember the zone of uh, proximal development, that little bar down here? This is burnout territory. Anything you already know that someone is teaching you, you will tune out of. On the other hand, students need to feel challenged. If it's just, OK, if you want a quicker way of doing an input map, here's a little trick. That's cool. But that's not so much learning something as just reading a nice little tip. Right? It's, it doesn't feel as challenging. If at the end of it, they feel just tired enough, just burned out enough that they've really stretched themselves, they will internalize that. They will make it theirs. Make full use of the technology. I am really bad at this. Use streaming, use YouTube, use podcasts, use Twitter, whatever it takes. Reinforce. Don't just put all the information in one place and say, well, go look at le lecture 17. Bring it up again and again and again. The, the internet has amazing capabilities. Captioning is incredible. Be careful of auto-captioning. One of my courses was auto-captioned, and on one of the lectures, I say the words, hello, welcome to Discovering God. Today will Taliban. Read the captions. All right, I've spoken a bit about student motivation. There's two broad kinds of motivation, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic is all the stuff outside you that is the reason you want to learn something. Intrinsic is the stuff that comes from within. Broadly speaking, grades, qualifications, uh, not being yelled at by somebody, getting a raise, whatever it is. If it's something else, that's extrinsic motivation. If it's, I've woken up, okay, when I was 23, I woke up and realized I didn't speak Japanese. That's terrible. I've now forgotten all my Japanese, but that's intrinsic motivation. Each of these has a problem. Extrinsic motivation is very easy to put in place. Gamification is a form of extrinsic motivation, right? Every time you do this, you'll get a star. Uh, competitive classrooms are extrinsic motivation. You'll do better than your students. The problem with these is that extrinsic motivation is not great at subject mastery because you're not actually learning for the subject, you're learning for the goal. Have you ever studied really hard for an exam, passed the exam, look back two weeks later and realize you will never remember any of that ever again. Algebra. All right? I mean, I, I, my parents w worked in theater. I was going to be a theater director. I had to do math. I studied algebra. I did really well in trigonometry and algebra. Can't remember any of it. I'll never use that again. 3D gaming. 
<laughs> really, you want to move something in three dimensional, you don't know trigonometry. Have fun. Extrinsic motivation is about the goal, it's not about the learning. The problem with intrinsic motivation, there are two, is that it has to come from outside. You can't give someone intrinsic motivation. I can't make you love learning for its own sake. You can fake it, but then your motivation is to keep me quiet, right? The other problem for this is that if you are somebody who we might call an autodidact, you love learning for its own sake. You learn because learning is amazing. Learn everything. The next shiny thing comes along, right? Oh, I'm going to learn how to do procedurally generated landscapes. It's going to be so cool. Look, Korean. <laughs> You've seen the movie Up, Squirrel. That's what we're dealing with here. So how do we encourage intrinsic motivation? How do we get students wanting to learn for its own sake? Not for the goal, not for some qualification, not to stop you nagging them, not to keep their parents happy. There's a few things we can do. One, give them a genuine win. Each tutorial should be, look at that, I have done something cool. If you're dealing with something that's long, so my original Godot course in Discovering Godot, we have to split up a bunch of videos because they're just too long. It'd be an hour long. So we split them up, right? But we have to make sure that at the end of each of those videos, the student is not, okay, well, this, is, this will continue next video because that feels like wasted time. This is time I could be doing anything else. Remembering if Buffy was as good as it looked when it was back in the 90s. You know, that's valuable time. I could be saying, was Buffy good? Give them a reason to think this is cool. Not just, okay, now I know how to do the skill, the skill but that looks awesome. Give them an actual skill that they didn't have before. This is tricky to do online, right? But tell them up front, here's the skill you'll be learning at the end of that specific video. That's that skill. Give them something fun, right? So for example, okay, we're gonna put music in the game and then the second half of the video, and here's how we're gonna do dy dynamic music. Now go back and find hooks that you're gonna use to make the music change. That's much more fun. Give them something to play. By the end of the video, they can actually have a game that they made that they can play, right? Not a framework. Frameworks are awesome, but they're not a great way to learn the engine. Something where I spent two minutes, I have a stupid little word game, but it's mine and I can customize it. And speaking of customization, give them somewhere to expand and grow. Ask them, how does this apply to you? What can you use this with? Where else can you put this? This technique is called metacognition, which goes over here. Metacognition in education is thinking about thinking. It's the critical analysis of your own understanding. Specifically, what do I still not know about this? How does this apply to me? Where else can I use this technique? Do I want to be using signals or should I be using group calls? Do I like dynamic GD script or should I be using typed? Why? Where can I put this new skill? I'm going to go back one slide. If you're going to ask questions and challenges, by the way, which can be great, they have to be meaningful and genuine. A genuine question in education is one that doesn't just have a normal answer, a yes, no answer. It's one where I'm not expected to guess what the instructor wants me to say. What is the best node in Godot is not a genuine question. Because either I'm, I've got one in mind and I want you to guess, it's control node, I don't know what it is, right? Or I'm just filling time. What is your most useful node and why do you love it? That is a genuine question. I care about your answer. The idea here is not what is the right or wrong answer. There are times when you need to test that. It's think about what you know, put a value judgment on it, and apply it elsewhere. That's what you're looking for. All right, real quick, I'm going to talk about some best practices. Genuine delivery style. Do not copy your favorite teacher. Do not copy your favorite YouTuber. Do not copy your favorite instructor. Be yourself. If you are somebody who likes to be very formal, be very formal, right? Nathan from JD Script does uh, from GD Quest does amazing tutorials. His delivery is nothing like mine. Mikey, my business partner, does amazing Blender tutorials. We're similar, but he's very different. He'll spend an entire video eating cubes on the screen he just made, right? I will sing songs while I'm coding because th that's how I interact with my students. But be you, because that genuine interaction is a way of showing that you genuinely care about your student's success. You might not know each and every student, but it matters to you that they succeed. If it doesn't matter for you that they succeed, you might want to pick an easier career. Please use big, easy to read fonts, especially when you're coding. You might code in a you know, standard 10-point font, whatever it is. 
it doesn't show at lower resolution. So if someone is watching your video at 480p in a bad network, they cannot read that. That is not going to help them. Speaking of, don't use red and green. 5% of the male population, slightly lower for the female population, have difficulty telling red and green apart. If you are using those for critical information, they're going to get confused or angry. Caption. If you can afford it, captioning videos is incredibly expensive. And I don't mean money, I mean time. Because it's not just writing down the script, if you have a script, I never use a script. It's matching time codes and checking typos. One skill per video. You can cover, you can touch on stuff you've already done, but each video should be one skill. So when I'm teaching a beginner course in Godot, the first thing we learn is how to print to the output. The second thing we learn is what a variable is. The, third link, the second thing is what a function is. Third thing is what a variable is. Fourth thing is what an array is. And then off by one errors. And now we have functions, we have variables. We're pretty much good to go, right? <laughs> I saw this recently. It was a really cool tutorial. I can't remember what it was on. It was like, OK, so we set this up. I'm just going to get the movement code in. Bap! Go back! Because I don't know if I've missed something critical. In fact, it wasn't movement code. It was shader code. I don't know shader. That's why I'm watching your video. Please help me. If you, if you can make cool uh, shader videos, by the way, please do that. Narrate what you're doing. It is so easy to forget that what is obvious to you is alien to someone else. If you use Control and A to add a node, just say, I'm going to press Control and A to add a node. The amount of comments I would get early on when I was making online tutorials, what did you just press there? You're going way too fast. You're not going fast. You're not saying what you're pressing. Don't make silent tutorials. You might not have access to a microphone. You might be nonverbal. But a lot of people need to hear what you're doing, not just read the code. If you're someone who's nonverbal or isn't comfortable in the language you're teaching in or whatever it is, use a text-to-speech parser. They're getting pretty good these days. It's not always ideal, but it's pretty good. Design a tutorial around the, the strength of your chosen format. If you're doing a quick one-off five-minute YouTube tutorial, now is not the time to be t teaching network connectivity. Right? If you're going to do that, that's a 20, 30, 40-hour series. Finally, for some of you, you might want to go pro. It's really satisfying. It feels good. It does. It doesn't always pay great. If you're going to be doing going pro, you're going to be working with people. They might be platforms like YouTube or third-party distributors like Teachable or Udemy or Gumtree or whatever it is. They might be publishing companies, companies that will market your course and do it for you. Some things you need to know. Read the terms of service, read them again, and read them carefully, and do this every time they change. Because if you don't, you might not know who owns your intellectual property. You might have signed it away. You might not. You might be doing something that is a breach of contract without realizing you're doing it. This isn't about they're trying to mess with you. Know what you've agreed to. I mean it. Shop around. The first offer you get might not be the right offer for you. What else is out there? How much do you make? How much do you make per video? I used to teach public speaking. How much do you make per video? What's the cut everyone else gets? Let me give you an example. If you were to buy one of my courses on Udemy, and it's on sale, and you want to pay a little less, so you get an affiliate code, fine, and you want it accessible on your mobile device. So the Android store or Apple store, the affiliate code, Udemy, the third-party publisher and I'm, I'm going through, and then me. If you buy my course for, let's say, $9.99 US dollars, under those circumstances, I will make 60 cents. That's fine, but now I'm making a very different course. Now I'm making a course where I just need to reach enough people, right? I can't spend five weeks on one video. It's just not a way to make rent. So if that's the deal you're going into, that's fine, but now you're having to get to a lot of people high. Are they going to help you with that? Maybe that's worth it. You know, if you're reaching 3,000 students a, in a month, that's, that's fine. That's decent cash. If it's 10, that's a Snickers bar. How much does the other party get? And what are they providing you for that? Remember, they're providing you a service. You're creating a video. You're providing them with the content. They're providing you with a service. Are you happy with that deal? If you are, fantastic. If you're not, keep going. What is their stance on non-compete? This changes. So if you're going with a company and they say, OK, you can put your content anywhere, 
but you can never price less than our full price. Know that going in. That makes a big difference. Who markets the course? If you love marketing, don't pay someone else to do it. If you don't, and you can't stand social media, get help. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, I've given you enough tools now to see the kinds of questions you want to ask to make educational content. The final place I'll put this is 10, 11 years ago, I was working corporate finance. I was making good money, helping rich people deliberately crash the economy and living in the Upper East Side. It was fantastic. I had a New York apartment and I didn't care about anyone and I was dying inside. I mean, it was killing me. I went to one of my bosses, you know this entire credit default swap thing's gonna go down. He went, yeah, we'll be fine. Cool. Now, I worry about money every few months. It's just what it is. I'm a freelance, self-employed instructor. But I feel pretty good about it. Because every now and again, one of my students will send me a clip of a video they made. And I know they could have done that without me, but they say, you were the inspiration for that. That feels much better. If you have the time to do this, I recommend it as a hobby, as a portfolio piece to show people why they should you know, bring you into their company, as a way of practicing your own skills, or just as a way of giving back to the community, as a part-time or a full-time job. Teach, it's worth it. Any questions? Mm. Videos. I've got a couple, a couple of comments to introduce to your theory. Um, and one, one thing I found about, about their video was they spent a lot of time sort of going into best practice. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, instead of just making a note, they create a class hierarchy because it's going to be useful when they make more notes in the future. Which, and because I'm an experienced pro, that's great for me. But on the other hand, it also means I can't give that video to the kids that I'm teaching because they, they don't care about best practice. That's, that's a good point. So I'm going to start by saying I'm on pretty good terms with Nate from GD Quest. And one of the great things about this community in particular is the people who make tutorials don't see each other as competitors. We're, we're contemporaries. We share information. We comment on each other's videos. Um, GD Quest are aiming mostly, they do have a beginning a tutorial or a couple of beginning tutorials at intermediate and advanced programmers. And they have projects that their community adds to. So if everyone's going to be adding to, for instance, their role playing game, we need to have a format. So in that specific case, they need to nail down best practices and the node hierarchy and all the rest of it. But you're right, that doesn't really help 10-year-olds, right? Because first, you need the lower end of Bloom's taxonomy. So they're aiming higher up that hierarchy that isn't on screen that I'm pointing to. So I hope that answers that question. This is one of the great things about online tutorials is the fact that students have that speed control because there is no perfect speed. If you have a strong English accent, someone is going to struggle with your English. And everybody has a strong English accent to somebody else. You should have seen me trying to teach public speaking to kids in New Jersey, or adults in New Jersey. Hello, yes, I sound like Mary Poppins. Can we get past that? <laughs> I was teaching some kids in Harlem once, and I've been teaching for an hour, and one of the kids went, you're British. <laughs> um, there isn't really a perfect speed. What matters is being at a speed that sounds genuine to you and articulating in a way that people can understand it or that the auto captioning can understand it. Um, if you are watching, and people do this with me, I mean, a lot of people watch my videos at double speed and a lot watch it at half speed because I speak quite fast, right? Find the way that you would normally explain this to a good friend. Treat the camera like a good friend. Like actually care about explaining this to them and break it down and you'll find that speed. Uh, hi. <clears throat> Thanks for the talk. It was amazing. Uh, do you have the same content in an online tutorial? Uh, well, actually, we were talking about, I was, I've got to speak to my business partner when I get to the hotel, putting this stuff up for free on our site. Uh, because it's useful, right? So we'd like to put that there. I don't want to charge for this because this is a 20 minute, 30 minute, how long have I been talking? Three day talk. Um, 
But yes, we do want to make it available for you. And I believe that this is going to be available on the YouTube channel. So you can also watch my firm figure all over again. When did I look like this? In my head, I still look 25. It's weird. Hello. First Hello. Of all, thank you for the talk. Um, uh, I teach computer science as my day job to uh, high schoolers and up. Um, and one thing I wanted to ask you is, do you have any tips for a course that I'm planning about for Godot specifically uh, for high schoolers with entry level knowledge of CS uh, that will be done in a physical classroom? So the real joy for there is going to be sharing and collaborating. Right? So maybe you want to split people into teams. I don't know how your, your school is done. So some do artwork, some do whatever. Uh, maybe you just want to encourage them to share how they've solved it. One great way of doing it is having code reviews. If you're going to do code reviews, you need to manage how feedback is done. Uh, I like Liz Lerman's techniques, which is every piece of feedback begins with I like, or I notice, or I wonder. Right? Because feedback is not about this was really good, I didn't like this, that's an opinion. Feedback is, here's an idea you can take to change it if it applies to you. And then it's up to you whether you take it or not. It's not a value judgment, it's have you thought of this. Um, another way, so when I did the Discovering Godot course, we start with a text-based game. We don't use 2D graphics at all. I mean, we, we have a chalkboard background and a button from Kenny. Um, but it's, it's essentially Mad Libs, right? So it'll, you type in some words, so some prompts, and it tells you a story. So start with something like that and work up. Customization, I think, is really where it's going to be at. So what kind of sprites can they make? What kind of movements can they make? What cool solutions or something can they find? Um, that would be my first tip. Bye. That would be my first tip. Um, I don't know if that helps at all. It actually does. Yay! Thank you. Does anyone know my password? Please don't know my password. Um, hi, um, I've been teaching at university, and one of the things that they really feel that are more complicated is when people have some kind of background, and then they have some bad habits. Uh, you have to try to combine them to to use proper, you know, um, be it a, a programming language or something like this. So, you have any tip or something to or advice on that Ooh. sense? Okay, so. Um, Bad habits or weird things you've learned from other programming languages or just from teaching yourself. I sometimes see students who like to, uh, and I don't know if this counts as bad, but like to use curly braces everywhere because they learn from C. I don't like it. Um, they do. Or like to put pass at the end of every function. I don't like it. They do. I find the thing to do is to get them on board as to why this is a bad habit and then make almost a game of it. It's not a judgment. You're not nagging them. Just make a ritual. Um, one of the things I did in Godot 3, before 3.1, was there was a, an issue, right? If you try to scale collision, the collision wouldn't work. You don't scale, you move the extant. So that just became a little mantra. So we're going to do the collision for this, remember? Extant's not scaling. And I find students start repeating this back to me as sort of a mantra. Find a non-judgmental, fun way to get them to invest in it and why it's good and get them to catch themselves when they're doing it. Right? Make it about them wanting to grow that way rather than about, I'm imposing my structure on you. I'm imposing my structure on you is a great reason for someone to try and fight authority. You're not trying to, you're not trying to rule them. You're trying to help them be better. So come at it sort of sneakily and under the radar. I think we're not online anymore. Well, okay, last question. Hi, you were uh, talking about finding potentially other people to market uh, your content. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are lots of people who claim they can use social media to market for you. So I would like to know if you have tips on how to find these people. Tips for finding people who are actually experts in marketing your content through social media. Uh, yes, find them and let me know. <laughs> OK, so there are companies who handle the marketing for you, like distribution companies. Like one of the things Udemy charges, well, takes a cut for, is the fact that they advertise your course. How well they advertise their co your course, if you're happy with that level of advertising, all the rest of it, that's entirely your judgment call. So they'll handle it for you. Social media engineering or social media expert is a really new job. And I don't know of any standards for it yet. 
I have a blind spot here. I am a massive introvert. I hate being in crowds. Um, I've learned to fake it, right? Because I have to move through this world. This is an act, this is a persona. Social media feels to me like homework, right? Going on Twitter and saying, hey everybody, have you remembered to do this? It's not about that, it's about sharing the passion. <sighs> Find somebody who's good. My advice would be if there's somebody in your company who's already good at that, make that their responsibility and make it th their growth, their potential to make income or whatever it is, is tied to the company's success rather than a flat fee. Honestly, that's not an ex area of my expertise, which is a disappointing place to finish, but I'm only one man. I have some questions from the audience. Ooh. They ask, what will you say it's your priority when teaching Godot courses? Teaching Godot or teaching game development? I try to, well, okay, so if you're buying a Godot course, you are wanting to learn Godot. On the other hand, game development is an incredibly useful skill to have as a coder. And it, it, it is a separate branch, but I like to bring that in as part of it. So I would say my first priority is teaching Godot, but immediately under that is game development. If it's not fun, you don't get the win when you finish the videos. If you don't get the win when you finish the videos, you're not going to finish the course. And finally, they want to know, uh, you say that you have some courses in Udemy and they want to know which ones are so they can find them. <laughs> um, I have Discovering Godot and I have Godot Getaway. Uh, both are currently available on Udemy. Discovering uh, Godot is being remastered slowly. Um, Godot Getaway is being made and it's actually part of three courses. So my business partner, Mikey, is doing a Blender course to make the assets for it and a music course to make the music for it so that students can learn the full pipeline or work in a group. I didn't want to bring them up because I didn't really want to advertise, but hi, you can please buy my things. I want a car. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.